Welcome back everyone to the next session. Our next speaker is Peter Day. Peter is Chartered MCIOB Construction Project Manager and also a member of ICPMA. He currently holds the position as a Senior Project Manager at Turner & Townsend. He has experience managing projects in the UK and Middle East from outline feasibility through the project closure. He has worked in multi-portfolio sectors starting from mixed use, commercial, healthcare, residential, educational, and research. Peter was the project manager for the delivery of the world's first 3D printed office of the future in Dubai, which won the ICPMA Innovation and Quality Award in 2018. Today, Peter will be sharing with us his insights about the importance and relevance of international collaboration for the success of construction projects. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Peter Day. Peter, the stage is yours. Great, thank you very much, Hargeet. Um, Look, pleasure to, to meet you um, virtually, albeit for the time being. Um, as Hagi said, my name is Peter Day. I'm a senior project manager with Turner and Townsend. And the title of my presentation for you today is International Collaboration, uh, Working Together to Share Success. So a bit about me before I get started um, with the presentation. So I'm a chartered construction project manager, and also a member of the ICPMA. Um, I've experienced managing projects in the UK and in the Middle East um, from outline feasibility through to project closure uh, across a, a variety of, of sectors, including uh, mixed use, um, healthcare, education, residential, hospitality, uh, and, and 3D printing as well. So I was the project manager for the delivery of the world's first 3D printed office of the future in Dubai, which um, I was very grateful to win the ICPMA Innovation and Quality Award in, in 2018. I was also shortlisted uh, to the final seven for the Overseas Project of the Year uh, Award for the Construction News um, Awards in, in London, in, also in 2018. So I've been based in the United Arab Emirates um, for seven and a half years now, and I'm currently working with Expo 2020 Dubai, and I'm providing uh, my, my project management services to them. Primarily, I'm, I'm leading and coordinating a multidisciplinary team um, for across the, the globe to deliver a number of front of house pavilions and also um, a range of front of house event architecture as well. So my presentation is looking at international collaboration. Um, and I'm going to be presenting a snapshot of some of the projects I've been involved in. And I'm going to be using some examples of how we've been able to successfully collaborate internationally across a variety of different project delivery landscapes. OK, so the uh, agenda uh, for the presentation, I'll begin by um, setting the international context. Um, identifying uh, examples of, of good collaboration and not so good examples. I'll then um, talk you through a series of, of project case studies, um, drawing um, specific attention to some, some more positive examples of international collaboration and how that's contributed to the success of, of these projects. And then we'll close with a, a quick uh, recap of the, um, of the key messages from, from the presentation. Okay, so international context. So the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, is a relatively young nation, but it has a hugely diverse population. You can see from the uh, illustration on the left that the local Emiratis um, only make up about 11% of the total population here, and the um, remaining uh, percent is made up of different expatriate workers. The real estate and development sector is one of the main dominant sectors here in the region, uh, in addition to, to oil and gas. And historically, it has relied on expatriate workers and international supply chains to deliver their projects. Working in the region has really sparked a passion within me um, of engaging with, with people with different ideas uh, from different corners of the world with the aim of, of coming together and, and sharing success and, and improving the industry that we are we're working in. Okay, so this is a illustration of something that I came across on LinkedIn um, a little while ago. And I, I thought it was a really good example of why good collaboration is important. Now it's not specifically um, 
setting out a construction project, but you can probably see the similarities here. So starting from uh, the top left um, square is how the customer explained the project, how the project leader uh, understood it, how the analyst designed it, how the programmer wrote the program, how the business consultant described it, and then coming to the, to the um, bottom left, how the project was documented, something which is um, non-existent here in this example, um, what operations installed, what the customers build, looks very, very fancy, um, how it was supported, and then finally, what the customer really needed. And you can see there's so many different interpretations of what the project looked like, and and, and bad examples of, of collaboration without anybody really coming together and fully understanding what they're being engaged to provide and what success looks like for the client. So collaboration, so good examples and, and some bad examples here. So we'll start with some good examples. So clearly defined project brief. So what does success look like for the client? What, what at the end of the project, does the client want to see? It needs to be clearly defined from the outset. A robust project plan and then critically collaboratively developed. So a project plan where you're engaging the different stakeholders and various um, supply chain uh, members early on uh, to form a project plan uh, together. Then moving through into collaborative forms of procurement. And there are some examples here, but um, framework agreements are, are a great example of a, a collaborative form of procurement. Pre-construction agreements, engaging um, the supply chain formally early prior to starting the, the build programs. And also design and build contracts enables design teams and, and contractors to work uh, earlier on in the, in the project life cycle. Then moving on, open and fair administration of the contract um, is, is critical in, in, in any agreement, whether it be uh, main contract agreements, subcontracts, you know, professional service agreement, open and fair administration is, is absolutely critical. Clear and regular communication, both upstream and downstream. So clear, regular communication on the what the project is looks like and, and, and the progress on it and identifying the key risk is, is incredibly important for the upstream. Uh, executive level reporting, but just as important is the downstream reporting and the project um, monitoring and controls and, and communication plans to engage with the supply chains all the way through the, the, the project uh, team. Embracing cultural differences and religious practices is, is very, very important here in, in the Middle East. Um, we work um, different days of the week. We, we work a Sunday to Thursday, whereas the majority of the um, uh, other countries in the world work a, a Monday to Friday working week. We have Ramadan here once a, once a year where um, the, the country effectively works for, for shorter hours and public sector services are, are not as consistent as they, as they are um, in other times of the year. And then benefit, benefiting from international time zones. So when managing international supply chains, being aware of you know, our working week being slightly different to the working week in Spain, for example, but benefiting from that. And, and if done well, you can really utilize it and actually, actually utilize a six day working week where you're transmitting information on a, on a Sunday and a Friday and using that as a, as a working day for the teams that are working remotely. So some bad examples, a poorly defined project brief, Poorly defined tenders awarded for the lowest price is, is something which we we'll probably all have witnessed in the past. This often leading to adversarial relationships in the supply chain. Goodwill leading to an unexpected claim, which is poor administration of, of the contracts. Poor understanding of risk transfer. Entities not understanding really the, the services and the uh, liabilities that they're actually signing up to, to providing. Inadequate project management tools and techniques, you know, lack of proper uh, monitoring, tool, monitoring tools, uh, inadequate reporting, um, and, and are some examples. And then when delays and disputes come around, it often leads to disappointment because we are not in the position we want to be as, as project um, managers. Poor understanding of cultural differences, engaging international supply chains and not understanding 
the actual um, capabilities and limitations uh, in in various different um, parts of it, parts of the world, and and wrongly assuming that um, what is a, a an understood deliverable in this part of the world is a different um, level of deliverable in a different part of the world, and then being unsympathetic towards international time zones and local customs. You know, there's there's no point in setting up a, a, a weekly meeting on a on a you know on a, on a Friday morning uh, in the UAE because you won't find any any people attending that. Um, so there are some some examples. Okay, so moving through to the first project case study that I'd like to talk about today, and it's the three D printed office of the future. So this was the world's first three D printed office. Um, now it's complete. It serves as commercial office and exhibition space. Um, approximately 350 square meters of built-up area, um, but it's printed layer by layer using a, a 20 foot tall 3D printer uh, located in, in Shanghai, China. So my role in the project, I was the project leader responsible for pre and post contract project and commercial management services. So as I mentioned, it was the world's first. So the, it was a, implementing a, a new technology um, which meant that the parameters um, were unknown. It was it hadn't been done before, so there was no precedent that we could use. Um, so it was an untested scope in, 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 in every way. It was a developing project brief with a global significance. The completion of the project marked the initiation of the 3D printing strategy here in Dubai. And you know, above, above all else, we had to create an inspirational space for the Dubai Future Foundation. And the Dubai Future Foundation is a, uh, an innovative um, uh, entity set up by the Dubai government to look at uh, future innovation for the country. Some examples include driverless cars and, uh, and other innovative technologies. So we had to be um, collaborative in the way that we were delivering the project, very much an international supply chain. The 3D printed units were printed in, in China. The office uh, layout was designed in, in, in the USA. It was engineered by a Jordanian engineering company, project managed by a British project management company, and installed by a Chinese contractor employing foreign labor on a construction site in the UAE. So truly international uh, project, and a truly international um, supply chain. So how do we manage this? Well, we had to manage it clearly um, and, and with, with clear transparency on, on the project and, and what was required. So we developed a matrix of work um, which covered all aspects of the project lifecycle from uh, design, procurement, um, um, shipping, installation, and, and also uh, warranties, guarantees, and, uh, and post handover uh, maintenance of, of, of the project. So one of the challenges that we faced was the structural performance of the building. So as I mentioned, it was an un untested um, scope. So the local authority here, the local mun municipality, didn't have any framework to certify the building as being um, structurally safe. So to enable the design to be developed into uh, technical design, we had to perform a series of structural tests uh, in China um, which determined the parameters that we could finish our technical design locally here. Once the 3D printed units were um, shipped um, over to the UAE and we took possession of them, we then had to replicate the um, same testing here in Dubai and demonstrate to the local municipality that it was safe and it was fit for purpose. And that um, enabled us to obtain the um, structure performance um, certificate from, from the Dubai municipality. So an innovative project uh, with an innovative supply chain. So as it was an untested scope, it was also an untested budget. So it was impossible to use a one size fits all approach for a project like this. So we knew we had to be collaborative in the way that we procured um, the, the various products and, and services. Essentially, we invited ven vendors to compete for selection by demonstrating their innovative products and services 
And in return, they were awarded the opportunity to be part of the project team and the opportunity that would bring for the future. This meant that procurement of goods and services was, was largely pro bono, which uh, means free of charge. This created a different dynamic, um, really around it was creativity, shared success, collaborative working, and really trying to um, make the project as impactful as it possibly could be using the combined intellect and abilities of, of the project team and their, and their resources. Nevertheless, there were key elements of scope that had to be clearly identified and contracted with the appropriate transfer of risk. And a couple of examples of these are the uh, local engineer of record services, so the design liability for the, for the design and the, and the building, and a general contractor for the um, contractors all risk policy uh, for the site installation services. Okay, so the second project um, case study I'd like to talk to you about is the Al Jerf master, master plan um, located in Abu Dhabi. So this was a large uh, mixed phase multi-use development scheme um, on behalf of Imcan Properties, who are a subsidiary of Abu Dhabi Capital Group. Major components of the master plan, you can see from the illustration, but the major components were site-wide infrastructure, uh, marine works, and the design and development and um, delivery of various different assets, including villas, townhouses, uh, clinical wellness resort, uh, other hospitality offerings, uh, low-rise apartments, uh, F&B retail, and, and various community facilities as well. Um, so my role, I was seconded into Imcan Properties as the senior project manager. And primarily my role was to define the work packages against the financial feasibilities that were being set by the finance teams, um, procure the suppliers and consultants and con contractors, um, as well as uh, administrating their contracts, then providing a, a project management function uh, between the internal and external consulting and contracting teams. So it was an ever evolving mega project. Um, so Sahil Al Emirates uh, translated means the Riviera of the Emirates. And the project was to be the seed of the Riviera of the Emirates in this area of the UAE. So it was a real flagship development. Um, there were multiple international signature architects engaged on the project. The plot itself had real historical significance as it housed a palace of a, uh, a royal family member. Um, there's a long program of work with multiple interdependent work fronts. Um, and this meant that it was vulnerable to change. It was vulnerable, vulnerable to change based on market sentiment. Um, and it was also technically a very challenging um, project from an from engineering perspective. So we had to be collaborative in the way that we procured um, a lead consultant in, in this example, so the procurement of a multidisciplinary lead consultant. So as I mentioned, there are multiple international signature architects working on, on the project, each coming up with um, various uh, conceptual ideas um, for, for the different assets that I mentioned in, in the earlier slide. So we had to be clear with how the multidisciplinary lead consultant would pick up this conceptual work by the signature architect, how they would work together and how they would then move forward with the design uh, into the um, detailed design and, and, and site supervision stages. So it had to be very clear uh, with the definition of how they were to interface with the international signature architect. So what package of work are you gonna pick up and receive that you are then gonna proceed into your, your detailed design with? We then had to be very clear with what their design deliverables were and also to give them some comfort and define lump sum, lump sum payment methods with them. And then moving on to the supervision services, so the post-contract uh, actual supervision on, on site works, we asked the tenderers um, to propose their own cost and resource schedules. Therefore, really trying to draw on their expertise and to define this element of their service collaboratively. So rather than dictating to them what they must provide for, for what cost, 
really trying to work with them to provide them with the information and, and allowing them to propose their, their deployment of, of resources and what that would mean commercially. So we, we're really collaborating um, together to define a contract sum that met the feasibility budget that we had um, within our finance teams internally. And that ensured a one-time board approval uh, for this package of work. So we achieved this through a combination of um, secondment services, framework agreements, and then traditional consultancy services as well. Okay, the third project um, I'd like to talk to you about is the NMC Royal Hospital. So this project um, was on behalf of NMC Healthcare, which is a FTSE 250 uh, company, um, and is a 750,000 square meter new build uh, clinical hospital. Uh, 250 beds, many different um, services and, and, and specialties, um, but uh, critically a clinical hospital, so technically, again, uh, very challenging. So my role, I was the site-based project manager and owner's representative, and I was appointed midway through construction uh, to manage the main contract uh, and also the interface of the client deliverables and the, and the client direct items into the, into the main work contract. So one of the challenges we faced on this project was midway through was the redesign of the interiors. This meant um, omitting the current interior design and initiating and contracting a new interior design package. This meant that there was a program uh, risk, there was abortive work risk and of course commercial risk as well. So we had to be collaborative in the way that we were going to approach this challenge. So the aspiration of the client was to engage an internationally renowned interior design consultant. Um, but it was critical that this was done um, whilst identifying their expertise, their local expertise. So not only are they internationally renowned, but they've also delivered work in the UAE before, and have an international presence here. So we were able to, to identify uh, the right person for, for this um, commission. We then agreed together and, and clearly outlined the deliverables and timing of packages. So we did this by a um, series of workshops with the main contractor um, with full transparency on our, our construction program. We identified the priority interior design packages, um, when they should be developed, how they should be developed, and how they should, they should be um, um, administrated into the main work contract. So here are a few examples of some of the packages that we defined. So we started off with the floor, the walls and the ceiling packages, which enabled uh, the contractor to, to be closing uh, uh, um, uh, walls and, and ceilings, which is critical for the, for the completion of, of their MEP works. Um, moving on to the casework and joinery, sanitary wear, and then the uh, ff &E, so the fi fixed furniture and, and equipment. And then finally, the VIP and Royal Suites were at the end, um, as that was a separate area of the hospital that we were able to um, uh, treat as a, a slightly um, separate uh, way in, in the programme. So key to the success of this major change um, was administrating the contract clearly and fairly for all. So we worked with the main contractor to place areas of the building on hold to, avo av to avoid abortive work. We then worked with the main contractor and our own project control teams to resequence the program to avoid unnecessary delay. And then we worked with the main contractor and the interior design consultant to go through a process of consideration regarding the selection and procurement of materials and suppliers. So where we could mitigate risk in terms of items that had already been used in the UAE before, where supply chains were already used to being supplying these types of materials and equipment. We identified that early um, with the interior designer. Um, so that, that mitigated the risk when it came to actually instructing this change to the main contractor. Um, and, and they were then you know, avoiding uh, any long lead uh, procurement uh, risk, which would prolong the program unnecessarily. Okay, and the final um, project I'd like to talk to you about is the 
Expo 2020 in Dubai. So this, this is um, one of my current uh, projects at the moment. So a little bit about uh, Dubai Expo for those of you who, who may not have um, come across a World Expo before. The World Expo is our large scale platforms uh, for education and progress that serve as a bridge between governments, companies, uh, international organizations and um, the, the general public. So Expo 2020 Dubai um, is going to bring together um, over 190 countries, various different private sector um, entities, uh, multilateral organizations and educational um, companies. And the idea is to um, connect under the theme of connecting minds and, and creating the future. So my role is I'm seconded into Expo 2020 Dubai as a senior project manager. And primarily my role is to lead and coordinate a multidisciplinary team from around the world to deliver a, a number of front of house pavilions and front of house event architecture. So a bit of an overview about Expo 2020 Dubai and a bit of an overview about global events in general. So typically they have a fixed completion. This year is slightly different because of, of um, obvious reasons, but typically um, when we look at events like the Olympic Games or a Formula One race or other um, events, they have a fixed completion. You know, the media is there and, and the cameras are going to be rolling on a particular day on a particular time. So um, programme is, is incredibly important. They're often fast track. Um, they um, very often involve signature architects as well. Very innovative in design. Um, these are very well known for, for showcasing the, the very uh, latest cutting edge um, design and what's possible. And they're international by definition. So in terms of um, delivery uh, collaboration, here are some examples um, to, to draw your attention to that we've um, in, um, observed um, during our, our time uh, working with Expo 2020 Dubai. So, is a strong example of design and build contracts based on very early concept design. Um, and this enables an early engagement of international supply chains um, and also fixing of the contract sum very early in the project life cycle. Um, because, because of their fast track na nature, um, they're very often payment milestones rather than progress payment. Um, just because it, it just it would become uh, very, very time consuming to um, to um, implement the, the progress payment methodology. Um, they're often an impermanent scope, uh, which means that uh, quite often at the end of the event, the scope is, is removed. Um, and this means that um, uh, more often than not, um, the main contractors are engaged um, on a, a design um, a construct and also a maintenance scope. So this means that service level agreements are also wrapped up into the into the contract agreement. And then because of the imperm impermanent scope, um, very often the title of materials and asset often remain with the contractor rather than um, being transferred to the client, which is a, a key difference in, in event uh, construction compared to um, the traditional um, construction market. Okay, so one of the um, projects I would like to give you an example of is um, the front of house structures. Now they, these are um, bespoke front of house metal structures of an ex exceptional quality and intricacy in design. So because of this, um, there's a requirement to engage experts for this and, and specifically um, an expertise is identified in, in Europe. Um, now, I, engaging with um, specialists of this nature, whilst complying with the onerous procurement and assurance standards of Dubai Expo 2020, is a real challenge. And also, um, you know, that's not to mention the obvious geographical um, and logistical challenges of um, delivering a project with a, a partner based in a, in a different continent. So, it had to be collaborate, collaborative in how we procured uh, the project and how we set it up for, for delivery. Um, so we did that by um, pre-qualification and early collaboration 
with the European project partners. So this meant understanding exactly what they do, exactly what they do, their, their capability, their capacity, what they've done before worldwide, what they've done locally, and how they want to in, be engaged on the project. How do you, you know, how are they comfortable working um, so that we can get the best out of them? So by identifying that early on in the project, when we had to come to a point or to procure um, a design and build um, contractor, we're able to very, very clearly identify in the tender documents how they should be approaching these various different European specialist project partners. So that we were enabled, we, we enabled us to get transparency that the project was being set up um, with the best chances of, of success within the wider supply chain, not just with the main contractor. So we did this by providing adequate scope definition to ensure the exceptional quality that Dubai Expo 2020 Dubai are looking for is achieved. So we did this um, by a, a responsibility matrix, a, a RACI, um, so um, identifying who's responsible, who's accountable, you know, who should be consulted and who should be informed throughout each stage of the project life cycle. You know, really breaking it down into, into, into quite a granular level of detail. Identifying, um, and, and this ensures that the collaboration uh, post-contract, um, the main contractor with the project partners, and with our, our own client side design team is maintained. So in addition to that, we main, maintained our, our client side design guardianship. There's a clear transfer of, of risk. So a clear transfer of, of, of risk um, to, to the various supply chain so that it was understood um, and, and accepted from the outset. And then payment milestones as well. So that there was transparency, commercial transparency um, throughout the um, supply chain um, that, that, uh, that helped in, in any um, uh, payment uh, disputes. Okay, so coming to the end of my presentation now, um, I couldn't come to the end of the presentation without talking about COVID-19 um, and of course the, the effect that it's had on, on everything, on, on every um, element of our life really. Um, and Expo 2020 is, is no different. It's been, it's been effective. So the event has been postponed. Um, so rather than opening its um, doors to the world in October 2020, um, it will now open uh, 1st of October 2021. So this caused severe disruption. So a number of the front of house pavilions were, were midway through construction. There was you know, almost immediate disruption to supply chains and the movement of people. Um, the event opening was, was postponed um, and there was extended contract durations and, and potential for prolong, prolongation costs across a multitude of, of different contracts. So we had to be collaborative in how we handled this postponement with the teams that we were managing. So we went through an initial rebaselining exercise, so what this postponement meant. Um, and then we looked at various different ways of, of, of handling that with the supply chains and the teams. So in some circumstance, it meant the granting of additional time. So um, where certain uh, packages and programmes were, were really compressed, um, we were able to grant additional time and smooth out the resources and, and de-risk a lot of the elements of construction. Um, so that was of, of, of benefit. Um, we had the opportunity to redesign certain packages. So you go back in um, to the design uh, with the benefit of more time and come up with a, a better, um, better resolved design, something that was more um, um, achievable, uh, that was better in quality, and, uh, and uh, again, that would de-risk the installation when we actually got on site with that package. Uh, we had the opportunity to retender certain packages. So um, where Perhaps programs have been um, stretched, or, sorry, stressed at, at, at that time. We're able to retender certain packages and get more favourable terms as well um, from, from the market. We divorced um, certain contract milestones. Um, so with this, we, we identified um, different milestones. So while um, the base build and fit out scopes in, in, in many cases was actually overlapping, we were able to uh, define new contract milestones to, to complete the base build element of the work and then 
um, de-risk the, the fit out scope as well, um, which was happening at a slightly later date. And there were a number of contract suspensions as well, uh, but these were defined and agreed in collaboration with the consulting and contracting teams. So where there are various organizations working across many different packages, we were able to rationalize that with them. And um, so that actually meant that it was, it was actually beneficial um, to Expo 2020 in terms of the value and the mitigation of, of risk. It's also beneficial to the teams that we were managing and that we were engaging. Um, again, both consulting and, and contracting teams. So really the key message here is it was it has to be flexible, it has to be adaptable, and there has to be benefits for everybody involved uh, for it to be a sustainable uh, way of, of, um, of administrating this postponement. Okay, so final, final thoughts. So key considerations when collaborating internationally. Um, I think I've touched upon it um, throughout the presentation, but a, a clear project brief. Um, it is absolutely critical, you know, even, even if it changes, um, which it usually does. A very clear contract scope, um, so that everybody is, is very, very clear what they are signing up to. Collaborating on the project plan together is, is incredibly important, drawing upon the strengths of the, of the um, stakeholders and the, and the international project teams that you're, that you're working with. Collaborate early and really build those requirements into the project plan. Embracing the various different cultural differences, so really getting to know what the constraints are, what they're good at, what they're not so good at, and breaking down those misinterpretations of, of, of what um, success might look like for the, for the different entities. Clear and regular communication, I touched upon it right at the beginning, but clear and regular communication upstream and, and throughout the supply chain. Just issuing pieces of information and, and, and hoping for the best. And then finally, benefits for all. Um, when delivering any project, um, it's important to have that in mind throughout every decision that, that you make. Um, and, um, and that is the final slide. So thank you very, very much for listening. It's been a pleasure to share this presentation with you and uh, I'd be delighted to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Peter, for sharing your insights with us. It was a wonderful presentation. And we definitely do read about the international projects, especially in uh, Dubai. Uh, but it's always nice to hear from someone who was actually a part of the project. And so I would uh, like to say that you mentioned in your first slide that for international collaboration, it's very important that we understand what success means to the client. And I truly agree with you. Uh, in my opinion, even if it's an international collaboration or, or local collaboration, it's very important to understand how success looks like for the client. What are the values that he's looking for in the project? So I think it's a, it's a very valid point. But were there like any challenges that you personally faced uh, when we were, you were shifting from UK to Dubai? Because the success might look like different. No, certainly. Um, there, there were real challenges. Um, it was um, working in the in the UK is, is a very um, developed and, and mature market where you know a lot of the delivery systems are very well refined. Um, you know the organisations and entities and people you know have been working together and fine tuning um, their processes and, and sequencing. Um, that really um, it um, it makes for very very efficient project delivery. In the international market is always slightly more challenging um, because you have different um, cultural norms, you have different um, countries that have their own way of, of delivering projects and when you are trying to bring all of that together in a, in a, in a, in a land that is um, you know, not, not, the, um, um, not the home to many different people, then you have to embrace that and you have to be aware of it, you have to accept that's going to bring um, different challenges and, uh, and enjoy it and try and make the, the try and make that be a benefit to the project not a not a hindrance would be would be my uh, my feedback on that thank you um, well I have a lot of questions for you but I will open them in the open uh, forum round because you you talked a lot about procurement and also about contracting so that is something that I'm really interested in so let's take some questions from the audience at the moment so Christina Stolz would like to ask you, 
how would you compare working as a PM in Europe to managing projects in the UAE? Are there any key different different shares one should know when considering working in one of these two areas? Yeah, I, I think um, it's kind of touching on, on on the point a few minutes ago. Really, it's um, it's moving really from a from a very established, developed market into into one where there's such a cultural mix of people um, here. Um, the real, it's quite a transient um, place as well. You know, the, there aren't um, many expatriates that perhaps call this place home for, for a long, long period of time. So, you know, you've got fresh ideas coming in all the time, which is which is terrific. You know, um, every project that you deliver, um, you meet somebody who has recently come from a different part of the world, for example. You know, the, a, a designer may have recently re relocated from the US. And they, you know, naturally bring their own native way of, of designing a building or of exchanging information or just, you know, and that, that really is probably um, the, the, the biggest difference, I would say. Um, to, it's um, you're, you're continually exposed to what's going on in different corners of the world, which is, which is a, a real positive. Thank you. Uh, I also have a question. I just came up with it. So as you have been working in UK, and as far as I know, there has been a spectacular architecture uh, being developed there. So it's quite different from the architecture that we have in Europe. So what what is the basic uh, challenge that you face sometimes in delivering uh, what the client really wants to uh, develop in terms of market, I would say? So the aspirations here um, for clients are very, very high, very, very high. You, you know, the the, the renderings that are, that are produced for for you know the flagship projects here, they are they're really eye catching and they, they look absolutely incredible. And, and really, the challenge is is maintaining that throughout the, the project development process. Really, um, and I think you know architects um, operate in this part of the world very, very successfully because. They have, um, they have the client's aspiration that they feel they, they can deliver. So they're really challenged and pushed to push the boundaries of, of what is possible. You know, there's, there's many world first projects in, in this region. I mean, the Burj Khalifa is the, the tallest building you know, in, in the world. Um, you know, the Museum of the Future is, is, a, is an incredibly unique um, design. If anybody's seen that, I don't, if you haven't, I'd urge you to Google it. It's an incredible incredible building um, and it continues to push on and, and it, it has done for as, um, for as long as I've been aware of the of the industry and, and it will do in the future so, so it's a really great place for, for, for architects and engineers to, to come and and push the boundaries of what is possible um, and it is great for construction project managers as well so to really become a bit more rounded in, um, in, in global construction. Uh, Christina has one more question for you. Uh, can you elaborate on the impairment scope, please? How do you measure success in payments in this case? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a good question. So these are payment milestones that are, are set very early in, in the project. So um, these are set collaboratively, collaboratively um, with, with the teams. So um, not an exact science, um, but it's often just something that is done um, to benefit everybody. Um, really, so typically um, with the in, in permanent um, scope, um, you know the payment milestones might be linked to you know, completion of design, to permitting approval, midway through construction because the programs are, are so tight, and the payment milestone at the end, and then um, then the final milestone coming at the end of maintenance and um, and the actual removal of the of the building scope. So that's typically how you could how it, how it's typically laid out. Um, but um, yeah, it's very different to the open market construction, which is based more on, on, on progress, um, um, actual site progress, rather than predetermined payment milestones. Okay. So before I end the session, just a last question from my side. How does the cost escalations look like in Dubai? Are they quite high as compared to UK? Or it's the same story everywhere? Um, I mean, I think... Closing the gap. So I, I talked in the presentation about untested scope, untested budget. I think if you can set off on a journey and you've got a precedent that you can you can use, then you're you're narrowing the gap of, of 
potential cost overrun. I think the challenge is here is they're always pushing the boundaries for to really um, to achieve something very very special. But naturally, there's going to be a heightened risk of, of cost escalation. Okay. That, that's how I imagined it, because whenever you see the spectacular buildings, the first thing that comes in my mind is like, did they really, uh, were they able to do it in the time frame that was decided in the beginning? Or if yes, then definitely the cost has to uh, escalate. Otherwise, it's somehow like a dream to make that kind of projects come true. So thank you, Peter. Thank you for joining us today. And we'll see you in the open forum round. I'm sure like uh, many of us will have wonderful questions. Uh, to get answered to. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.